So we're just going to talk about um, like kind of scholarship with these models and kind of quickly go over validity and um, how to create validity for some of these models. Um, so why do you want to do research and scholarship? Mostly just so that you have some recognition for your awesome hard work, right? So if you create a model and it works and your residents feel like it works, there's no reason not to do something with that. Obviously, it's hard to just have, hey, I did this model and publish it. It doesn't work out. You have to have something to prove that it's a good model and that, you know, even if it's just residents being like, yeah, this was great, you know, if you have that data, that counts. So, you know, there's Boyer scholarship, which is, you know, innovating new models for procedural training meets the entire circle of discovery, integration, teaching, and application. Um, so we have then Glassic's criteria for scholarship. So we have clear goals. So SMART goals are attainable, relevant, timely, um, adequate preparation, appropriate methods. Uh, so detailed instructions as well as an evaluation checklist with significant results that your residents or your expert people believe that it actually is helpful to do either the procedure itself or the model itself is valid. And then the last part that we're doing, you know, effective presentations. I am sharing this information to you um, at different meetings. And then reflective critique. So even just kind of having fellows, residents present something that they've created at SAM, IMSH, which is the um, big medical simulation conference in January every year. Um, there's also you know, other conferences that allow this just to kind of get some feedback from people on what they feel. You could, an easy way to do that. So applying scholarship, you know, detailed model descriptions, videos, activity evaluations. So that is exactly what I was kind of alluding to before, where the residents were like, yay, thanks for letting us do this. But you know, that counts. Um, if you are currently not doing this in your simulations, getting evaluations of every sim that you do, even though it seems cumbersome, if the residents get into that and just expect that part of their simulation education, then you will start having a lot of data that you can then get your residents and med students and yourself to go through. Um, checklist for assessing, so mastery learning, checklist, then have people assess on that checklist, clear goals and objectives, and then pre-learning. So you want them to go over the, you know, some sort of YouTube video or something like that, that they go over that procedure and know the indications, know the consent, know the risks, know how to do it and kind of how to explain it. So the iterative process is building and then rebuilding. So the thing is, is that you're, you're going to build it first and it may not work and that's okay. It's not going to be a slam dunk every time. So you're going to rebuild and improve and then maybe you can republish. So sometimes you can get, you know, multiple things out of one. Um, so these are just some options of places that will accept um, publications on homemade task trainers. One of them is the Journal of Education and Technology in Emergency Medicine. The ALIEM blog. Um, Ian and I's uh, co-resident Nikki Joshi was very heavily involved with that so she was very in sim too so she pushed that a lot. Um, Curious which is a Stanford peer review publication um, that it, you can get uh, quick publications on and then the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine as well. So just some thoughts of places to do it. So now you've published it, now what? Well, maybe we need to do some validity. So validity is the cumbersome topic that we all know and love in simulation, but um, <laughs> it's really difficult to do sometimes. And I think in sim we're like, oh great, they're learning, we're good, we're done, we don't really need to worry about it, but getting validity is good. So it's the extent to which an instrument accurately measures what it's intent to measure. So what are we validating? Are we validating the model, the procedure, or are we validating the checklist of that procedure that happens to be on our homemade model? So the validity is the extent which we you know, measure reality, and the model validity is the extent to which this task trainer represents the actual task. So with low fidelity sim, 
We're not really aiming for that, right? But sometimes we can, depending on you know, what we're looking at. So like Charles kind of alluded to this earlier with like the feeling of the bumps of the trachea, if that's really important for bougie use, that would be pretty realistic, you know? Um, or it stops at the carina, that kind of thing. So um, how do you do validation? First one is kind of a procedural checklist. So this is the easiest way. So when we're assessing someone and they're doing a lateral canthotomy or they're doing a central line, you have, they get consent, they do the next step, um, you know, they sterile conditions and then they, you know, do a timeout and that kind of stuff. And then you have these checklists and you create a checklist that what you think as the person doing this procedure is the most likely. And then you get a bunch of experts and you create um, kind of an option and you say, hey, which steps would you believe that someone who has done these has mastered this procedure? Um, there are validated checklists out there for multiple procedures already. So you don't have to do this. But if for some reason you're doing it for a new procedure or there isn't one for lateral canthotomies, then you may have to do this. This can be done over the internet, through email, through Survey Monkeys. It does not have to be done over five hours in a conference. So just so you're aware of that. Um, and then you will take the checklist. Then you have to validate once you've gotten all your experts and they all agree that this is the the steps that I require that, or I would expect a PGY2 to be able to do. You take it to the actual procedure and you use your model to have it and then you see, make sure that you have some inter-rater re re reliability, which is you have two observers, they both complete the checklist, you come together and make sure that they have the same, right? That they both agree that that person did that. So um, in Chicago, we do a thing called Simtastic, which is a, every residency in Chicago participates this where the PGY2s go to a different sim lab and we assess them our facts, so like for example, Resurrection, which is a residency in Chicago, comes to the University of Chicago Sim Lab, and we, University of Chicago North Shore faculty, assess them on very, two procedures and two sim cases. And we have validated checklists where we have to fill out, and then we do a global assessment scale at the end um, to kind of say, I, you know, I expect that this person is a five because this is exactly where I expect them to be. Um, so they did a bunch of kind of when it first started this research. So that's validation. Any questions on that? I know that was quick. And, but you can see why probably not many people are very excited about validating anything. Yes? Uh, first one's a tough question. Does the subject of IRB? Uh, so anytime you're involving medical students or residents in any sort of study, the the safe thing to do is to get, and, and you're planning on publishing it, is to get a medical exemption IRB. So you will have to do it. If you're doing it as a, the, the checklist like validation part, the initial part, no, probably not. To do a Delphi, you don't have to do an IRB for that because there's nothing, you know, but when you're actually checking the residents and it may have something to do with you know, if that data goes back to any program and you're publishing it, then yes, it would need an IRB. Okay. And then, do you have anyone in your writer team, one of these evaluation that, do you have someone review the wording for like the wording and stuff like that? So technically that is what your experts should be able to help you with because they may, you know, you can even just do an initial kind of comment section where they're describe. you know, you're like, does this make sense? Does this wording make sense? And people will give you that feedback. Because sometimes I know um, I've participated a few times in this um, kind of expert validation and the things that I initially get, I give a lot of feedback because I'm like, this doesn't make sense. The wording on this doesn't make sense. People are going to give different things. So then they allow for that. And then once multiple rounds have gotten through, right, you've narrowed it down, you narrowed it down, you narrowed it down, and your consensus is, you know, 95% of your experts believe that these six steps are agreeable, the wording at that point is probably pretty on point. Did that answer? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So we're done. Um, so again, we hope that this has inspired you with your low fidelity task trainers because I really think, you know, especially in EM, 
especially for our low frequency, high risk procedures. There are no task trainers out there, and if they are, they're cost prohibitively expensive. So um, we encourage you to MacGyver. And again, nothing has to be pretty. It doesn't have to be pretty. I think a lot of times we're like looking at the Lairdall models and we're looking at the nice, you know, blue phantoms, and we're like, these look so nice. I could never create something like that. It, the residents don't, your med students, you, your attendings even don't care. They just want to have the steps. They want to do it. They want to do it over and over again. Um, and publish them. Use your hard work. Get those academic promotions. And then look to val you know, validate your evidence. OK? Questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you. OK. We're good.